Welcome to the final in our public lecture series for 2014 and to the midpoint, I think, in our two days of reviews for the Masters of Architecture program. Um, can I just extend um, uh, our res uh, all of our uh, respect and gratitude to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to their um, elders past and present that may or may not be here. Um, can I introduce to you uh, Professor Hyungman Pai from the University of Seoul? Thank you. <laughs> um, it's just with such, it's such a great privilege, um, Hyungmin, to, to have you here. Thank you so much for coming down. Um, as you all know, because we've been broadcasting it widely, um, Hyungmin Pai, along with um, his co-curators, won the Golden Lion at Venice this year, which is just such a great, um, a great honour. Yes, congratulations <laughs> for the Korean Pavilion. And just let me read out to you the other things that he's doing this year because they're quite extraordinary. A collaborating director for architecture at the Asian Cultural Complex, the ACC in Guangzhou, which is opening in September in 2015. And that's working with Alejandro Zeopolo and some of the Elements um, work that was in the Elements Pavilion at Venice. And he's the chair of the, uh, the Mok Chon Architecture Archive and guest curator at the Samsung Museum of Art. Um, so, Hyungmin's work in his publication, The Portfolio on the Diagram, has been incredibly influential on my work, and that came out of his um, doctoral thesis from MIT. So, we're really looking forward to hearing about what you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, Hyungmin. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you for that generous uh, introduction. So, am I okay? Yes. Okay. So. Okay, so today I'll be talking about three things, and I've sort of like bombastically titled it The Status of Things. It's actually, um, I'm going to give an introduction about three projects that I've, I've worked on this year, and uh, I'm almost embarrassed to see how much work I've been doing. Uh, but uh, two of these things are, um, are done actually. The uh, Korean Pavilion is of course uh, coming down with the uh, Biennale in about 10 days or so. And then uh, right before I, uh, I arrived, I left in the airport, I sent my uh, last stuff uh, for the uh, exhibition on mass studies um, at the Samsung Museum of Art. Uh, and that's opening next week. Uh, but the Asia Culture Complex is a major, major uh, uh, endeavor, and it'll go on and on for many, many years. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was trained as an architect. Uh, uh, I became a historian um, and critic. But recently, I've been doing a lot of curatorial work. Uh, and uh, the title is, is try to figure out uh, what the hell I'm doing. Uh, while I'm doing these things. And so when you're really, really busy, uh, the problem is sometimes you can't really think through things. And so uh, this is really the first time that I've brought these three things together. And so I'll have to be very brief about each uh, project. Uh, of course, uh, I'm very proud that uh, we won the Golden Lion. And uh, it was about uh, the architecture of North and South Korea. Uh, and it was the first kind of exhibition that uh, tried to deal with this. And so uh, the, uh, my uh, uh, co-curator and the commissioner of, of this uh, year's Korean uh, Peninsula is uh, the architect Min Seok Cho, who we'll be talking about a lot today because uh, I was curating, I am curating uh, his exhibition. And um, uh, initially, uh, the, the, the way we got uh, this commission was that we proposed that we would have a joint uh, exhibition. Uh, this, of course, didn't materialize because of the political situation in, uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but, uh, but we did pull off uh, an exhibition that involved both Koreas, and that was the first of its kind. And of course, you know that it was part of uh, REM's um, larger uh, uh, theme, and that uh, the particularity of this year's Biennale was that REM insisted on having the national pavilions share a common title, uh, Observing Modernity, because this year is like the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War, and so it was sort of going back to the past 100 years and seeing how the uh, each uh, 
country dealt with modernity. And then uh, there are going to be parts of the elements of architecture that will be important to my talk. And so uh, we'll get on to um, first the Venice Biennale. And um, uh, uh, one of the points that I want to make about curatorial work is that it is fundamentally collaborative. That a lot of people, different peoples with different roles, work together to pull off uh, uh, a successful exhibition. And that it is uh, in the nature of, I think, particularly architectural exhibitions more than art and other areas that the collaborative work is essential. And, uh, and it's not just collaboration of different people. I think the issue of, of how uh, uh, things, materialities, uh, spatial design uh, interact with other kinds of, 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 of work. And so when I am involved in, in curatorial work, work, I'm usually sort of like the intellectual guy, you know, uh, because of my, um, of my background as a historian. So I'm usually involved as a, the guy who writes and sort of thinks through things, and I'm usually in charge of the book and the catalog. And so uh, uh, through that, uh, I've been thinking about what the relation is between space and things and words and how they're presented in a kind of totality of the exhibition experience. And so that's why I'm, 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 I have the title Status of Things. And, uh, and I've had, now I think I'm, I'm, I can call myself a curator. I usually wouldn't say that. I would say that, you know, I also curate exhibitions. But, but after Venice, I think I, I would put in my resume that I'm a curator, not because I'm increasingly doing more exhibitions, but I, I, I think I've sort of established sort of like what it is to do a curate, you know, uh, to do an architectural exhibition, in, you know, in, 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 in terms of, uh, of its um, uh, intelligence, let's say. And so uh, uh, one of the important uh, you know, projects that I was involved in previously was three years ago, I was chief curator for the Gwangju Design Biennale. And, and the two co-artistic directors was, uh, were Ai Weiwei. And then uh, this is Mr. Seung Yeo Sang, who is uh, perhaps the most prominent Korean arch architect. And three years ago, we had a kind of title. I really won't go into this because of lack of time. And at that, at that time, one of the key sort of um, uh, issues was how to design the installation. And so the two artistic directors had different ideas. Uh, Ai Weiwei wanted a sort of like, it was his term, he, he called it a supermarket. So you just have a very simple neutral grid, and then you put all sorts of different things in it. Um, uh, that was Wei Wei's sort of idea. And then Mr. Sung had a different idea, and he wanted this to be a kind of city. And so that he would actually design uh, its, its very large sort of installation spaces uh, as a kind of different morphological uh, formations. And so you had different types of sort of uh, uh, formal strategies for each sort of space. And then you would mix up all the themes. And, it created a really difficult uh, job of trying to coordinate all of the different things that go into a large biennale. But uh, Weiwei was uh, in, in, incast not incarcerated. He was uh, <laughs> uh, detained in the middle of our biennale. And so Mr. Sung won that sort of argument <laughs> <laughs> by default, because Weiwei was not around. And so we, we had this kind of uh, uh, installation that really doesn't happen. You don't go into these large Biennale sort of designing every sort of backdrop and things, but, but he wanted this. And, and we had this sort of like really interesting sort of kind of, uh, this is a, of course a um, um, 3D model uh, of, of the space. And at first, you know, everybody was really, really uh, worried about this. You know, you know this is a, a, a bad idea, it won't work. But then as the, the installation came out, this became really fascinating. You know, this looked like a formal, you know, much better than anything Peter Eisenman would have uh, been able to do, like these formal things without any content. And, uh, and they had sort of like this urban morphological idea. And then 
the installations came up, and it really was like a city. And so it was a kind of architectural exhibition, like, like uh, this very, very naive idea that you would create different spaces based on architectural in intervention into the installation sort of actually worked. And so I was, of course, worried, and I had to do a lot of the work of the coordination. But, but that sort of started me thinking about the nature of, of exhibitions as architecture. What is the nature of architectural exhibitions? And, and, and I, a lot of my experience uh, went through, as a curator, went through, the, went through Venice. And so uh, this was my third time uh, take at, at, at Venice. So my first was six years ago. Uh, uh, and then two years ago when uh, I worked with uh, Roger Dina of Dina and Dina for a, a pavilion when, when David Chipperfield was uh, well, this, uh, the artistic director. It was a small little installation about the different national pavilions, uh, working with Gabriel Basilico, who, who, un who tragically has passed away. Um, and just for the small Korean pavilion, which is a really interesting sort of small exhibition space, it's, it's very particular because while most of the uh, pavilions in, in Venice are sort of like these small sort of white boxes, were, which were first designed for, for painting for, as, as a white cube. Of course, I think the Australian pavilion was very different, and I'm curious as to how the new one will turn out. But, but the space itself is very different. It's, it's a glass box, and there were circumstances, um, um, because it's the last pavilion in, in the Giardini, uh, and the only way they could pull it off was to, to promise that it would be a transparent st uh, structure that would that would not block the lagoon and, and, and the existing uh, garden uh, planting and, and things like that. Uh, and so the space itself has, has, been, uh, has, has changed depending on what the exhibition uh, has been. And so this is uh, one year ago for the art exhibition. Uh, the artist, um, New York-based uh, artist Kim Suja, sort of transformed this into a kind of glowing lights, light box. Uh, this is six years ago when I was uh, curating the Korean film. It became a black box of, of, of video. And this is uh, this year's uh, Venice Biennale. And you can see that uh, Min Seok, who was the commission and also the installation designer, uh, decided to fully utilize the space as, as it is, uh, the sort of transparent uh, space. And, and this Korean pavilion had, had been un, under a lot of harsh criticism because it was very difficult to do a traditional art exhibition because of all the glass and, and the light coming in and all the nooks and crannies um, uh, that had to happen for this building to, to exist in this spot. Uh, but sort of Min Seok's idea was that he would use every little corner and he counted 19 sort of corners. Um, so it was in contrast to the four corners of a, of, a, of a cube, he had to deal with 19 corners, and he did a wonderful job. I think uh, uh, the reason that I think we were, we were generously acclaimed was that the nature of the space uh, uh, had a particular quality uh, in relation to the quite the dramatic content of, of uh, North and South Korean architecture, and that worked uh, to our advantage. And so we see the installation process going on. Uh, I'll go very quickly. So we are using every part of the building, using the skylights, uh, putting installations up. So it's an exhibition that you can look down into from the rooftop. Uh, you use floors with carpets, um, use the ceiling spaces. Uh, and for example, normally uh, you would not think of using uh, monitors in a open sort of glass space. Uh, you would think that you needed a darker space, you would need um, uh, darker walls, but we just sort of decided like, let's just think that we're looking, you know, watching our TV in a, in a bright, you know, living room. And so we, we, we did these kind of things um, and I'll talk about sort of the specifics of the exhibition later on. 
So we ended up with this very light, uh, transparent, breezy uh, space. And you know, you know, if, if you've been in Venice, you know that it's, it's a very sort of tough stay there. You know, it's a huge thing. There's no way you can actually see everything, even if you had several days there. And so normally you're, you're very, very tired and sort of you have this sort of obligation to see everything and be serious and, you know, like, I'm at the Venice Bill. I'm trying to catch up with all of the contemporary <laughs> goings on in, in the international scene. But most of the time, you're usually very, very tired, you know. And so uh, uh, it's very tough to sort of be focused in this dark room and, and sort of obliged to, to study everything. But our space sort of had this sort of airy, you know, uh, uh, residential kind of feeling. And so you went there, you know, you just sort of like the breeze outside. And then if you feel, felt like it, you would look at the details and things. But if you didn't, you know, it's just sat on the couch and then, you know, sort of rest a bit. And we are the only pavilion that has a restroom, toilet. And so we have a, a great advantage over other national pavilions. It's upstairs in the rooftop, actually. And, and you know, the transparency of the space was fully utilized. Uh, it, it's all credit to Min Sok's uh, uh, capacity as an, as an architect and, and installation designer. Uh, I was uh, most. I was in charge of the of the book, the catalog, and so the way we collaborate. And, and I was talking about the importance of collaboration. So Minsog is sort of like the designer architect. I'm sort of like the the editor of the book. And so the way that we worked is that that initially we thought we would do a North South Korean thing. And so in our minds, somehow the space was divided into two. And then we worked on that for many months, and then you know we understood later on that we were very naive about this thing. You know, so people in the know knew that that the collab, you know, a joint exhibition was out of the question. And so at some point we decided. So we 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 decided uh, we couldn't do that. Uh, but we, but during that few the few months we had already amassed a lot of material. You know, but uh, we really didn't have a kind of conceptual. Uh, framework of how to deal with this, uh, not just spatially but also uh, conceptually. And so the only thing was we had two, two spaces divided north and south. And so we needed some way to organize uh, a lot of the material we already had. And so I was editing the book. Uh, and I was editing it without the idea that these, these conceptual divisions would become something that would organize the space itself. I was, I was editing this as, as, a, a, as a writer. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out the linear sequence of this book and how to thematize uh, both North and South Korean architecture because it had never been done before. I mean, it's, it's, it's seriously that, that nobody had written a book that contained both North and South Korea. Uh, there were photographic uh, books that dealt with it, but you know these are photographers who spent like a couple of days in, in Pyongyang. They would become instant experts. They would spend a week in Seoul, and then they would put this book together. And um, but of course, we didn't want to do that. And so there was a big challenge of how how to conceptualize these things. And so I'm not an expert on on North Korea, you know, at all, at all. I, I I still am not, uh, but you, you, you look through the, the material, uh, see how you can organize it, and so I ended up with um, these large thematic categories, uh, reconstructing life, monumental state, utopian tours, and borders. And so utopian uh, reconstructing life deals with post-war reconstruction in both North Korea and South Korea. And so uh, the impact of the Korean War uh, uh, the ideology uh, that emerged uh, through the experience of the war uh, was very different. Uh, in Pyongyang, for North Korea, uh, the major cities were totally bombed. Like 90% of Pyongyang was totally leveled. And so uh, the carpet bombing actually you know, really began in the Korean War. Uh, and um, and so the ideology of, of, 
of rebuilding the state was linked to rebuilding the city itself. And so it was sort of like the founding mythology was that we are going to build, rebuild our city with our own two hands, that, it, that we would create a new socialist utopian state. And so uh, reconstructing um, the city through its architecture was a central sort of ideological uh, mission for North Korea. And so it's very important. And so we, were tr we tried to show that um, in, in photographs uh, about, uh, you know, this, this, a lot of images of building of the construction site, was, which was ideologically key to North Korea. In contrast, you know, Seoul was relatively sort of uh, left unscathed uh, through the Korean War. About 20% of the central city was bombed, which is, uh, you know, was okay. But, but to use my sort of phrase, uh, we, we destroyed ourselves through uh, uh, the bulldozers on the ground. Uh, North Korean cities were destroyed by bombs uh, coming, raining down from the sky, and we destroyed our own city uh, with bulldozers. And so the, the experience of South Korean uh, rapid development uh, through bureaucratic capitalist mechanisms, uh, uh, Pyongyang is the most meticulously planned city in all of the world. And so we try to contrast that, the kind of desire mechanisms that are very, very um, obvious in, in, in South Korean uh, culture, contrast to, to the ultra-planned uh, socialist vision of Pyongyang uh, was one theme. And then the second theme was monumental state. We're dealing with the status of the architect, the heroic architect, and the monumental building which were which were key to both North and South. And so we sort of uh, contrast the, the differences of the status of the architect. Obviously, the, the image of the architect is very different from a socialist country where the, the architect is extremely important uh, role in rebuilding uh, the, the nation. Uh, but at the same time in North Korea, the uh, paradox is that the, the architect doesn't have a name. So they're, they're part of this sort of like the people who, who build it, you know, they have heroic tasks, but they don't have authorship. And so we had a, a lot of, of, of uh, difficulty trying to identify who actually designed this building. You know, it's, we don't know anything. And it's, it's difficult to get the actual names of the architects. It's usually, when you see a North Korean building, it's usually like a, a, a some kind of organization. Um, and most of the time, you just don't know because it's, it's not recorded. Um, and, and in most cases, uh, because South Koreans by nationality uh, cannot have access to North Korea. Like the tragedy is that, that uh, South Koreans uh, cannot go to North Korea, whereas Europeans and Americans, all other nationalities can go to North Korea. North Korea is the same, you know, they, they, they. So, so we had to use um, uh, outside sources uh, what we, we called a, uh, a radically mediated relation. And so our access to North Korea was always mediated by, by foreign, foreigners, um, uh, authors, photographers. And this is uh, one of the more interesting North Korean uh, ventures. Um, uh, North Korea is, is very good at building these huge monuments. You know, these like, mul like uh, uh, Statue of Liberty scale monuments. Uh, there's a market for that, particularly in like dictatorships around the world, like <laughs> African dictatorships need to build these things. And the only uh, artists who have the know-how uh, are North Koreans because they've been at it for, <laughs> for quite a while. And so they're very good at it. They know how to deal with the material, the construction, the scale. And so uh, it's an export uh, industry for the North Korean uh, artistic uh, sector. And so we contrast and, and uh, compare similar North Korean, uh, this, this is uh, the children's um, uh, library in North Korea, Pyongyang. This is the national, old national museum in Seoul. Uh, similar period, similar motives. Uh, if you look at it carefully, you can identify uh, certain differences. Uh, 
the third theme is borders where you usually deal with DMZ. It's, it's, it's the line where the North and South Korea actually uh, physically uh, and spatially meet. And so you deal with, uh, you have like a very serious kind of uh, documents, uh, US uh, military maps uh, documenting the movement of, 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 the, of the division uh, during the war. Uh, recent uh, analysis by architects about the nature of the DMZ, uh, the kind of uh, uh, complex social networks that create certain types of connections despite of, of the seemingly sort of impenetrable uh, division between North and South Korea, and then to uh, artistic interventions. Uh, South Korean artist, uh, a bridge that will link North and South Korea, North Korean monuments. And then there was a special section that we devised. Uh, uh, there was a, we were trying to locate people, identify people who would sort of be the mediators to North Korea. And a lot of, most of the cases, you know, I, I, I talked about the instant experts who, you know, like people who, who braved their way to Pyongyang and spent two whole days there and then they have the, I was back from the jungle and <laughs> I have these, uh, these fantastic pictures of these, these uh, um, barbaric unknowns and, and I'm gonna show everybody my great experience. And, and so we hated that, you know, we, were, we hated that condescending and very, very sort of narrow portrayal of North Korea. And so we wanted somebody who really was, you know, in the community. And so we discovered this, this Brit, Nick Bonner, and, and he's been in Pyongyang since 1993. And so he was a landscape uh, trained, landscape ar architect trained, Sheffield, and something like that. And then he suddenly went to uh, uh, Pyongyang and thought it was great. <laughs> and he set up a, uh, a uh, tourist company there. And so he's the longest sort of uh, continuing tourist company office in Pyongyang. He's based in Beijing. And then we, we went into his uh, uh, website and it was very, very sort of like any website you would see uh, promoting their sort of destinations. And it was very straightforward and none of the kind of condescending sort of attitude and patronizing attitude. And so, okay, so this is the guy we want. And so we contacted him and we found out that he's a collector also. And so he's been collecting things uh, from artists. Uh, he even commissions uh, artists and architects to do new work. And so now his, his passion is movie making. You know, for North Korea, movies are the big thing. It's sort of because of socialist propaganda, you know, that old idea that, that uh, cinema is, is for the masses. That continues on. And so uh, he, his, his passion right now is, is, is movies making, so he's sort of like a producer director. And he's really part of the, of the community. This is his collection of propaganda posters that we exhibited. And he has a, a fascinating collection of like original uh, sort of uh, Korean artist work. This is, uh, this is socialist realism, but it has a very peculiar, uh, it, it was the largest original work. It's, the actual work is larger than the screen actually. And it's, uh, it's in ink, it's in uh, uh, Chinese ink painting. And so it's very different from like the Chinese socialist realism or the, or the Soviet kind. It has a very sort of soft feeling to it. Um, if you look at it carefully, all sort of strange innuendos about the relations. <laughs> Why is the sky sort of like blowing in? <laughs> things? And so uh, uh, this was sort of like the highlight. So we we decided that we're going to have a separate room for this, you know. And so th the idea was that, that I was going through the catalog, how to edit it, and so I, I, we thought that like Nick Bonner's uh, works would be sort of like spread out, uh, and then in the book, it made no sense. And so I said, we, we need to have him in one separate section. And so what I'm trying to say is that, that, that uh, as I edited the book and sort of came up with these themes, we suddenly were able to move past the north-south sort of division. And so we began to have an idea about how to, to organize the space. 
And so, so uh, even if I uh, actually hadn't been thinking about organizing this space, this sort of editorial work of the book, of, of organizing sort of uh, words, uh, sort of went to the installation design and affected it. And then that changed the mechanism of, of, um, of the design strategy. Uh, Nick Bonner had, became, had his own room. And then the three uh, uh, categories, themes, sort of were spread out uh, in a very sort of loose fashion. And it worked very well. Uh, 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 and so when, when um, uh, So uh, I'll, I'll go past through this. Uh, and so during our, you know, it was a great experience, you know, the one in, once in a lifetime experience. Um, when we were awarded the uh, Golden Lion, uh, I thanked Ram. Uh, and uh, what I said was that, that, uh, that this exhibition, this, this North South Korean uh, venture could only have been done as an exhibition. Because as, as in the present sort of state of our knowledge of North Korea, or North Korea's knowledge of South Korea, a, a, a book that made sense just couldn't be done. But as an exhibition, you could do it. You could, you could sort of like uh, experiment and do it, and, and you know, the Biennale would justify the sort of kind of loose intellectual uh, uh, underpinnings of this and made it a, a kind of convincing project. Um, and and that, um, that the idea of the exhibition informed my sort of editorial work. Uh, I, I would be very, very have been you know, anxious to, to do a book on this, but the exhibition sort of allowed me to do it. And then as I just explained, as I edited the book, uh, that sort of influenced the installation, the design. And so we were going into circles, a very kind of productive intellectual circles. Circles and, and so we, we ended up with an exhibition that was very, very influential in terms of thinking through these different things. And so, for example, this kind of comparison that we, we saw, we could, we could not do this as a book. Of course, in a book you would do these, ex, uh, you know, put these two photographs together, but you couldn't really write anything about it. You, didn't, you just didn't know anything about these two uh, projects, even the one in South Korea. This is the famous uh, Arch, of, Arch of Triumph in Pyongyang. And this is a similar period a cultural center in, in South Korea. And so uh, maybe you could write two, three sentences about these two things. But you couldn't really uh, carry an intelligent narrative uh, through uh, and make it uh, a convincing thesis. But as an exhibition, it allowed you to do it. And so. Um, um, Japan, you know, the Japan pavilion is right next door. And so we're, you know, always ultra sort of sensitive about what our neighbors are doing. Uh, you know, like, in like these, uh, the, ju the judge, judging sessions, you know, the, this time they actually told you when the judges would come. And so you had to be ready sort of for that. And then, we, they went into the Japan Pavilion, and so we were counting how long they were actually in there. And so they were there for like 30 minutes, and so they were in our pavilion for 32 minutes, and so <laughs> we won. <laughs> so like we were, at, we were at that sort of like juvenile level, you know. But uh, uh, there was a bit of sort of, uh, sort of real sincere comparison because the Japanese uh, pavilion, they call it the J Japan pavilion actually, uh, dealt with a, a much more narrow sort of topic uh, because obviously they have a much more developed and, and, and uh, more mature, sophisticated uh, history and culture of modern architecture. And so uh, Kayoko, who is actually the commissioner, is a very good friend uh, and she decided to focus on the 1970s and 80s, and she sort of, 80s actually. She felt that that was sort of like the in-between period um, uh, that was not really dealt with after like uh, the, uh, the uh, metabol metabolist thing and then before uh, 
uh, postmodernism that was sort of, she thought that was a period that hadn't been really studied. And so she brought in a lot of new material that was quite fascinating, a lot of original material, and she did a lot of research. And so, you know, it was fascinating to be inside the Japan Pavilion and looking at everything. Um, and so uh, a lot of people called our installation a archival project because also we had a lot of stuff here. And then the Japan Pavilion had a lot of stuff. But I thought there was a fundamental difference between the Japan, the Japan Pavilion and ours. Uh, in the case of Japan, they have much more sort of developed knowledge, sophisticated sort of uh, scholarly knowledge of what they were displaying. And so in their case, they had a lot of documentary archival material that supported every kind of installation. And so when you were confronted with something, you had a lot of things to go through. You had to read stuff and things like that. And on the one hand, it's very, very, very didactic and educational and you learn a lot, but you usually get tired. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm the academic kind of sort, but I was sort of like, I couldn't take it anymore. And sort of like, I, I had to get out of this uh, space after a certain moment. We were much more, you know, carefree. <laughs> we really didn't know what we are. Uh, a lot of times we couldn't really explain our, our stuff and sort of a lot of it was just sort of like, hey, why don't we just put these two things together? <laughs> don't they look interesting? You know? And so uh, I, I, my, my, uh, my essay in the book was called Confessions of a, of a Crow or something like that. And, and I was really saying that we did this without really uh, having a, a, a developed knowledge of North Korea. And so in, in a way, our space was much more relaxed, was freer. We didn't, we didn't burden people with the idea that there was something to learn, there was a stable uh, sort of historically well-researched knowledge that you had to sort of uh, learn when you are in the space. And so we, I thought that we were not archival at all. It was sort of, we were much more experimental. We were trying to do new things and this was more an archival research uh, kind of project. And so one of the advantages of this year's Biennale was that REM had, uh, had obliged all the national pavilions to follow the, the common theme of absorbing modernity. And so I thought it was a, a great idea. Obviously, you know, we won and so, so uh, it, it, it tended to be positive, but in previous uh, biennales, uh, it was very difficult to talk about and compare different pavilions, you know, because everything was very different. Uh, of course, the, every artistic director would present an overall theme, common ground, uh, more, more ethics, less aesthetics, or, or, or whatnot, but the national pavilions really sort of, really didn't, uh, you know, follow that. But this year it was serious, and, and the way that REM influence sort of, uh, you know, uh, influence the selection of each national pavilion commissioner. You know, the J Japan pavilion, Kayoko, is an AMO product. Min Seok, our commissioner, is, is OMA product. A lot of the national pavilion commissioners were sort of under REM, sort of like. <laughs> so <laughs> in different ways, uh, they were all very, very happy to follow REM's um, uh, directive. And what they created was a kind of comparative uh, uh, sort of, uh, guideline where you could actually talk about the different pavilions because they had this common look back on your 100 years of modernity. How are you going to look at it? How are you going to install it? And so for me, it was a, a great lesson in different curatorial strategies. And so, for example, the, um, the German pavilion was exactly maybe had one sort of was one example, exemplar of how you do an architectural exhibition. And it is to create real scale architecture, full scale architecture. And so the way they did it was they would insert a full scale replica of a building, existing building, into that, their neoclassical sort of structure. Um, but in this case, I thought it was not successful, actually. Uh, there's this sort of thing here, I'm not sure, most of you will probably be unfamiliar with this. And so you see that and so sort of think, what is this? And so you, have, you get this explanation from the curators that this is a reproduction of, uh, 
of the Chancellor, German chancellor's uh, residence, official residence, during the 1960s. And the reason this is there is that apparently during the 1960s, the German chancellors would use this, this official residence as a kind of backdrop to television sort of scenes. And so they would have interviews or, or, or make pronouncements with their sort of home in the background. And that came, gave a kind of homely sort of uh, feeling to their political gestures and statements. And, and the creators felt that this was a very important aspect of trying to domesticize and, 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 and have a homey feeling to German politics. You know, I, 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 list, I, I, you know, I understood, but I didn't get it really at, at, at the kind of uh, sensual feeling, uh, sensuous feeling of the exhibition itself. And so I thought that they were hanging their hat on the effect of the space itself. This had to be effective architecture that made you sort of like, oh my, what, this is, a, this is a, some kind of powerful space that you felt that you need to know and then you would start to sort of get interested. But if the architecture didn't do that for you, and then you had to get to explain and then you had to read this, this text, this is, this is the only way uh, unless you buy the catalog where you can actually understand what this is. And so if you hang your head on, on the architecture itself, then the architecture has to be really strong for it to work. And I thought that in this case, it, it really didn't do that. And then one other opposite way of dealing with architectural exhibitions is to have a concept. You, know, you, have, an, you have an overriding intellectual structure of how you're going to uh, do this, what it means, and then the installation itself follows that intellect, the sort of like conceptual structure. So in the case of uh, the U.S. pavilion, uh, they were going to deal with the influence of American office structure around the world. And so they, they had all of the uh, projects, uh, not maybe not all, but, but they did a ton of research. I think they're still doing it. The book that they're going to make is like, 2,000 pages, something like that. <laughs> and uh, so they have like 2,000 uh, architects involved. Uh, they're going to sort of show the global range of, of uh, United States architecture, and they're going to recreate the office and have you know, this space function. And it's a perfectly great idea. I think uh, conceptually you understand how it works, but in the space, you go there and then you don't really sort of like uh, feel anything, you know, so you go through, you, you understand the conceptual structure. And so in this case, uh, uh, this happens a lot when sort of like intellectuals do, academic types do exhibitions. You begin with a certain idea, a concept, and then the installation design tries to fulfill that concept. And of course you see that in studios, of course, you have concepts, ideas, and then you have to uh, create a design that, that is true to that. And of course, there's this sort of this gap between the actual spatial experience and the idea. And so um, uh, I, th I thought that we had sort of like the, a very haphazard way of, of dealing. It was not our own intention, but the situation of it made it a kind of haphazard uh, uh, process where you had all these different things uh, uh, material from North and South Korea that was there. We really didn't have any kind of organization except the North-South thing. That was untenable. And so we had a lot of stuff, things around us. We didn't know how to conceptualize it. The, the idea, the intellectual organization came later. That sort of fed back to the design. And then so it went around in circles. And, and that was a very productive sort of uh, 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 kind of process, uh, and and um, and it was necessary because of the situation. It was not that we thought that this was the way to work, but the reality of the situation necessitated it. And um, and we had this title, which is Crow's Eye View, you know. Oops. And actually, this is the title of of a modernist poem. Uh, 1934, uh, it was a poem by the first sort of like Dadaist poet uh, in Korea. 
And uh, this is the Chinese character for crow. It's read in Korean O. But actually, the, the more general sort of word would be cho. This is bird. Uh, and you would pronounce it cho. And so bird's eye view would be chogamdo. Crow's eye view would be ogamdo. And the way the, the general bird becomes a crow is you just take out this one little stroke here. And so if you take the eye of the bird out, it becomes a crow. And so we were contrasting the sort of like universal, all-seeing bird, and then the bird with only one eye. And that's us trying to deal with North Korea and South Korea. So we, had, we understood that we had a very limited uh, uh, viewpoint. Uh, we, were, we were working with, with uh, unstable knowledge, limited knowledge. And so we, we, we were trying to find a way to work through these things. Uh, and, um, and I think that created a very interesting sort of dynamic between the space, the things that were, were exhibited, and of course the kind of intellectual construction that uh, has to be involved but is always sort of incomplete and, and it's, it's, it, it has this sort of dynamic relation uh, with the space and the thing. So these were sort of like the comparisons that we were working with. Uh, this leads to the second, actually, aspect of my uh, presentation, the collection that I'm building up at the Asia Culture Complex. And I had been sort of starting, I had started that work early this year. And, um, and this is really by coincidence that I had thought that we would, would collect full-scale elements, pieces, mock-ups of buildings. And then uh, I had heard about it, but you know, arriving in Venice, REM had this separate section called Elements of Architecture. And it actually turned out to be the most controversial part of his installation, because a lot of people were very unhappy and uh, unsatisfied with the way this exhibition was installed. And uh, the, one of the main uh, arguments against it was that it only had elements and it didn't have grammar. It didn't have a kind of overall idea of how these elements would come together as architecture. And so how can you say that elements constitute architecture? It, it, was, it was virtually a trade show of sorts. And so a lot of people were very, very uh, directly critical about the way Rem had approached these things. Actually, you know, quite frankly, I, I really didn't get that when I, when I first saw it. I was, you know, it was interesting, but when I heard like Peter Eisenman sort of uh, writing that out, and so, oh, okay, okay, so, so there are people who think that they're in architecture, you have these sort of established mechanisms of organizing elements, disciplinary systems, that make architecture. It's not just elements that do it. And so I understood that. Um, uh, and one of the connections here is that, that uh, uh, I was going through these elements and I was saying, OK, these are the things that I need. And so I met Alejandro uh, Zairopolo, who, of course, just recently stepped down from Princeton. Uh, and it had to do with this, actually the ongoing uh, thing in Princeton, I hear. But, um, but he had created this sort of uh, section called the facade. And so uh, he just show you a few of, of what he had collected. And so I was talking to Alejandro, do you have like, uh, an idea of what you're going to do with this after the experience? So he was talking with different institutions, um, Maxi for one, and uh, all of them were a bit, I think, uh, unsure because they didn't have the space to have these. And so I said, you know, I'm going to take them, you know, me, me, me. And he was very happy uh, to, to have these over to the Asia culture complex because he understood, he had, he had entered the competition for that complex. And so he knew the program, the scale of it, uh, its ambitions. And of course, he knew that I was going to be around and that we would be working together 
to develop a continuing sort of collection of these things. And so uh, we had an uh, agreement in principle in Venice. And so now, with 10 days left, we're, I think about seven of these pieces will be shipped to, uh, to Gwangju uh, uh, in a month or so. And so we're, we're beginning. So these, this Venice facade will be the foundation for, for our collection. So it's not just these things, but we're going to collect sort of like full-scale pieces of facades and elements. Uh, one of the controversial projects recently finished in Seoul, Zahadi's uh, Design Plaza. And so the, the building itself is, of course, controversial, but, but Patrick's sort of passion about sort of these manufactured pieces is, is quite commendable. And the whole technology of it, the, the, the manufacturing know-how, uh, uh, this is fascinating because it was designed in London. Uh, it, the manufacturing know-how was developed in Seoul. It was manufactured in some place in China, and then it was shipped back. And so there's the sort of like this global mechanism of fabrication that is, is a very central piece of how buildings are made. And so we had this sort of narrative uh, that was important um, for us. Of course, we're going to collects uh, certain things that are directly involved with Asia. Uh, this is a uh, uh, very uh, prominent Korean architect's work in uh, Cambodia. He, he's building something very similar in front of the, uh, uh, what's the famous uh, thing in Cambodia? Uh, temple. The temple. temple. Excuse me? Temple. Yes, yes, Angkor Wat, Angkor Wat. Uh, and then sort of, uh, this is a very, very particularly Asian thing. Like we had a certain period where almost all Asian countries with wooden uh, sort of timber uh, tradition would use concrete for those things. Uh, it's fascinating actually. If you do it well, it's really, really <laughs> amazing. The details that go into trying to make fake like wooden uh, timber details from concrete. And then we are developing building workshops. Uh, of course, wood is sort of like the Asian tradition. And so our first workshop will be, uh, will be held uh, next year in February, uh, dealing with uh, how industrialized wood can be quote unquote Asian. Uh, so we, we have Kengo Kuma uh, working with us uh, for that um, piece. Uh, some of, and then the, uh, uh, the urban collections. I won't get in too much into this because uh, these are all in the works. Um, and uh, the reason we can collect these things is because the space is humongous. It is the largest institution of, of its kind. Of, uh, it's the largest cultural institution in the world. And I'm not I'm not saying this because I want to brag. It's, it's <laughs> it, uh, it is a problem, serious problem. Um, Gwangju is 1.5 million city. Uh, it's famous for its Biennale, but it, it cannot, it would, will not attract the people to sustain this thing. So this is sort of like the last sort of overbuilt project pre-financial crisis. Nobody understands why they built it so large. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's an absolutely insane uh, thing. But at the same time, you have to deal with it. You know, it it's there. You can't take it down. Uh, a lot of government public funds are invested in it. And so it's a multicultural sort of complex. Uh, it was built, the project was uh, initiated uh, to commemorate the uh, 1980 People's Uprising, which is an essential sort of uh, moment in, in the democratization of Korea. And so you have a memorial museum for democracy. You have a theater that houses in all like 2,000. You have exhibition halls. You have a children's museum. You have the archives and collections, which I'm working on. And so um, this is the theater movable theater, its stage goes up and down. It's, it's sort of like the universal theater. 
This is the exhibition hall. And so this is like airport hangar scale. And we have three of these. And so these are like, you know, this is the Children's Museum. And this is our archives and collections. So you can see the scale of it here. Uh, this is in meters. Yeah. 150 meters going on here. <coughs> so this in itself is a huge, it would independently be a huge institution. And so we have this space and no program for it, you know. <laughs> Literally no program. And so uh, uh, I wish we had many, many years, and, and we lost, you know, we, we wasted many, many years sort of uh, spent on, on projects, research projects that didn't do anything. So like they have like tens and thousands of reports that doesn't, doesn't do anything. Uh, what, what are they, what do they call the pork, pork belly projects or something like that given out to academics and things like that. But, but the, I, they didn't understand what a collection involved so that you had to actually bring things in. And, um, and so we have these large spaces to fill. And, and so when I was uh, appointed early this year, I saw this great opportunity. Nowhere in the world do you have this kind of space available to bring in stuff. Uh, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, these are the spaces that, that uh, are involved here. And so I was diligently trying to sort of organize how, how to, to use this space. Uh, it has to be popular, I and mean, this is, a lot of it is Korean. Uh, I'm just sort of, this is bragging actually, sort of like how hard I'm working on the plane back and forth from China. <laughs> working on, on, on this project. And so because of the large scale, so it, its agenda is that it has to bring in people. There's no way that you can run this thing without having sort of uh, uh, it becoming a popular destination. So it has to be a different kind of, of institutions from, from say a, like a Getty uh, where, or, or a CCA where it's very, very secluded, it's very precious. Um, um, and so you have to have uh, to be able to get popular access. But at the same time, you need this to have a kind of level where, where you have professionals and academics and expert access. And so how do you sort of create the organization and the space for that way? And th those kind of things are constantly on the works. And so I won't get into this too much, but, but one of the things is that we knew that we had to be public uh, there was the Asian agenda, no matter, you know, it's a very difficult, uh, tricky thing to deal with. Uh, we knew it had to be contemporary. We knew that we couldn't compete with older European and American institutions that have a, that have a large Asian collection, which was predominantly traditional. And so to say that we're going to collect, create an Asian collection, a pre-modern, Asian collection would be sort of like ludicrous and or, or stupid or, or those things. So it would have to be contemporary and being contemporary necessarily meant that it would be international. And so these things were involved and so uh, we created strategies, uh, the scale of space, uh, the thematic, uh, we wanted it to be uh, more thematic than author-centered. It had to engage the public and we had to really work fast. You know, we lost a lot of time, and so uh, while I'm trying to figure out what to collect, uh, I have to, to sort of conceptualize this and collect at the same time. So when I, when I go to Venice, I, I just say, I'm gonna do this <laughs> without really, you know, uh, of course there are a lot of questions even in my own mind, you know, why do you bring these sort of like things into Venice? And so, I'm thinking and collecting at the same time, and and uh, and I think I I I convince most of the bureaucrats because they're very worried. They're going. To, this is going to open next year. They have nothing in place, and so they even if they don't understand <laughs> what the hell I'm doing, they, they have to say okay because if they don't, then then nothing will happen. <laughs> and so we have these themes. And so I was thinking, you know, what are we doing really? And so 
the way I, I explained it, and it, this was apparently quite convincing to a lot of uh, people, is that we are doing something that, that 19th century European institutions did 150 years ago. For example, like the way the Victorian Albert Museum was formed was during the mid 19th century, uh, it was a period of rapid development in, in, the, U, in, in the British Isles. And so a lot of old buildings were being torn down for new development. And so these, these sort of pieces of old buildings were there. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't understand the historical relevance of it. Of course, they were going all around the world, you know, bringing in all sorts of stuff. And if it was deemed valuable, they would send it to the British Museum. And then they were, ha were left with a lot of stuff that they brought, but they really didn't know what to do with it. And so even now, of course, you know, the v &A is a lot of like haphazard things all around. You know, they have no idea why, what it is. And, and so there's a history to how these things, full scale pieces, ended up in the VNA. And eventually, you know, you, you start to understand what these things, and of course, when the museum system in the West established itself, it sort of had this kind of categorization of what these things were. And then these pieces started to gain a certain kind of Eurocentric meaning. Of course, we don't have that sort of system, but we think that eventually we'll make sense of all these ordinary pieces that, uh, that nobody collects, of course, because they don't have this sort of artistic value. But in the end, like these, this stuff at the VNA, uh, they will become historical pieces. And then sort of our understanding of it will be created uh, in the process. Uh, Maybe a much more sort of stabilized uh, setting is the recently created Cité de l'Architecture in, uh, in Paris. And so in their case, you know, they, they, they create, they've created this room much later, and so they have these pieces that some are original, most are recreated by cast, but they have this sort of sequence of, of spaces that are full scale. But I think they have limitations of, of what they can do with the uh, with uh, the pieces. Upstairs, there's the modern room, and then in the modern room, uh, eventually, it's inevitably, the pieces are smaller, and so I think we will be uh, the only place that can consistently collect uh, large pieces of contemporary and modern uh, uh, architecture. And then finally, uh, I'm not sure how I'm using time. Okay. Uh, I'll be very brief with this. Um, I've, uh, uh, this uh, show will, be, uh, will open next week, and it's a show about mass studies, uh, Min Seok Cho, uh, the principal, and of course I've, I worked with him for the Venice Biennale. And uh, we've titled it Before After, Mass Studies Does Architecture. And, um, and we sort of conceived this as an exhibition that deals with, deals with the process of, of architecture. And of course, you know, you could deal with the process of architecture. So this is the before room, where you sort of document and, and put all the things that come before the actual building. And then this is called the after room, uh, which has sort of like all the kind of mediated images, all the def deformations of projects that occur after the realization of the building, usually in images. And that's sort of, so this like the now, sort of like, because architectural exhibitions usually cannot bring in actual pieces of the building. So it's never now. It's always something that happened before or after. And so this is uh, the only full-scale piece. This is called the Ring Dome that, that was uh, installed in different places, such as Milan, uh, the Vittorio Emanuele uh, uh, Galleria in Milan. Uh, it was in, in front of storefront uh, at Kenma Square in New York. And then it was also in Yokohama. And now for the first time, it's in, it's in Seoul. And so this is sort of like the only full scale piece, actual piece. And so this is the, sort of like the symbolic now. And we're going to have events in this sort of space. So this is before and after. And so. So you would think that if the topic is the architectural process, 
Another way you could have done it was beginning and end. Uh, and I thought that there was a really fundamental difference between uh, thinking about architectural process in terms of before and after and beginning and end. And I thought the, the narrative structure was fundamentally different. So we are familiar with beginning and end because it is a, a very, very Western tradition. So the way you conceive and think about architecture is, is you, you, you uh, assume origins. You, you assume the beginning of architecture. You see, assume founding ideas, principles. And that can be uh, identified in the primitive hut, in, in Solomon's temple, or, or uh, and, and, and of course, the, the, the idea of, of beginning and end is a very Christian idea. And so in this kind of sort of Christian eschatology, you have the birth of Christ as the beginning and then sort of like the second coming as the end of the world. And so you have this idea of, of beginning and end. And, and, and the division between... Uh, Why, why am I going? Okay. Before and after the birth of Christ actually is more a beginning and end narrative. And so we are used to actually uh, thinking through things or gaining meaning about events that move and change through this logic of beginning and end. So, so things are justified if it fits into the overall larger sort of conceptual structure. But if you're true to the before or after logic, then sort of you have to sort of stay at the moment, in the moment. You have to find meaning uh, in the moment as these things are, are happening. And so uh, for me, I sort of uh, conceptualized our exhibition. Of course, this is the famous Death of Architecture by Aldo Rossi. And so if you have a beginning and end sort of structure, then after it ends, you have a series of post, post something and post, and sort of you, you end up in a kind of quandary unless you sort of begin a new kind of beginning and logic. And so uh, in a way, the postmodernism sort of thing got caught up in the beginning and end sort of logic, and, and it's, it's still a very difficult task to get away from the beginning and end logic and find a, a different kind of way of, of thinking about things. And so the... Uh, the before after was sort of conceived as a kind of, of way of thinking through things within the instability of, of the relation between things and words. Um, and so we, we are sort of like thinking on our feet as we create these structures when we collect sort of full scale pieces and bringing in to the ACC. We really don't know exactly what it means. We don't have a kind of overriding uh, historiography or, 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 or eschatology uh, to sort of understand or place these things uh, in an overall scheme. And, and that's a condition, I won't get into that, a, condi a historical condition of, of, of the nature of Korean history where we, are, we don't have these kind of large conceptual mechanisms. But you just don't want to do stuff without, you know thinking about it or, or, or sort of understanding what, what, what you're doing. And so uh, this, this process of before and after, we thought, was, was a, a, a process of, of creating concepts. And that the whole, whole architectural uh, process was a kind of performance. And so the way we explained this exhibition is that we are presenting architecture not as a kind of stable object that sustains a stable meaning, um, but a kind of performance that produces and creates uh, new ideas that are very unstable but provisional, but at least keeps us on our toes, constantly sort of being able to think about what we're doing was the important thing in our whole endeavor. And uh, I guess that's the status of things <laughs> as far as I'm concerned um, back in Korea. But I think it has wider implications. Thank you very much. Thank Questions? Thank you, Young Min. Can you, yeah. We're recording this, by the way, so into the microphone. Thank you very much. That was, that was great. I, 
I'm reminded of um, Peter Greenway, the filmmaker. I don't know if you know much about his museological work, and he refuses to take on the term a curator, which I would also offer to you. I, I think it's much more about collection than curation. For Greenway, he wants to circumvent the authority of the object mm -hmm. as well as the, the authority of chronology. Mm -hmm. So he makes these exhibitions that have no connection seemingly and affords the viewer or the participant to find their own way through, to make their own connections. And it strikes me that that's the, the similar architectural language that you're talking, yeah, that, yeah. that it's not up to you as an authority, you're more of a, what should I say, a, a provocateur in a way. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, I think it's, the, maybe I, it's not a question, it's just no, an observation. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think the, what I've presented is, is not new in itself, I think. The, the, the thesis is not new in itself, but I think the conditions itself is something um, uh, that, is, that is very different from, say, what Greenway, Greenway might be doing. Is that he's reacting to this sort of overall sort of situation, and for me, I think for for me and and Min Sok and and others who are sort of working in this situation, it's sort of a kind of reality that you really it's it's part of the the reality of things, and so you are compelled to work in that manner. I think, uh, and and I think that if you look carefully, there might be a kind of difference. Uh, it would be a very interesting venture to look at how, what the difference would be uh, w with that kind of approach within a kind of uh, sort of Western sort of configuration where you have uh, these larger sort of uh, historiographical conceptual figurations that you're sort of working against with. I think we are also in that, but not as directly. We have a different kind of uh, for example, we're running against Hegelian sort of te teleology, let's say. Uh, but the way sort of that Hegelian teleology works in, in Korea uh, with a specific history, uh, I've been part of that, my own experience. I was brought up to think that I had a specific mission in life, <laughs> that I was, I was uh, born a Korean to make a Korea a wealthy, nation and I had to work hard <laughs> and you know you were you were brain you know brainwashed to do that uh, and that's the reason I work so hard I guess <laughs> but of course you 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 at some point you understand that this is not the way reality works and and that you have to find different ways of sort of trying to really think through these things um, and and I guess that's the only I guess uh, response that I can can have to your comment. I've, we've we've actually talked. To, he's the uh, the the director for the butcher, the the wife, yeah, and and uh, the thief, and yeah. Actually, that's the only movie he he deals with uh, an architect. There's a movie that deals the belly of the architect. I haven't actually have seen that, but uh, yeah. Hongming, thank you very much for the lecture. Great essay on curation in architecture at the, as it currently stands. So it's an, <laughs> really enlightening to sort of hear the perspective you bring. I just wanted to ask a question about the, the enormous museum, you know, that yeah. you're, you're currently trying yeah. to navigate. Uh -huh. And really, it's, you said, it, you know, one of the thematics here is an Asian thematic, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, an Asian focus. Where do you draw the limits to Asia? And maybe another way of asking that question is, uh, uh, how can we help you with the Australian contribution <laughs> to Asia? We, I, mean, I presume it's, it's, Glenn Merkert, well, you've been talking with Glenn? It, yeah. uh, uh, the first task at hand, realistically, is, is political. To trying to convince bureaucrats, yeah. mostly, uh, uh, that, that this has to do something with Asia. And so the first, the most dangerous thing uh, is that uh, that when they, when most people sort of think about Asia, they think about pre-modern stuff because it looks Asian and it's, it has a regionally Asian thing. But, uh, but for the things that I'm doing, I have to, of course, explain to a lot of people why this has to, has anything to do with Asia. And so that was like my little sort of spiel about the fabrication mechanisms of, 
of, you know, and, and that sort of, and, and people, uh, some people are quite taken by it, actually. I was surprised that that sort of logic about how manufacturing is now global and that Asia is sort of like the factory of the world and that we have to understand this and that's why we're bringing these things and, and we want to activate these objects um, and engage people. And so, so it's a very, for me, a very uh, provisional sort of uh, idea. Uh, it's a useful concept as long as somebody doesn't really sort of like, you know, badger you, you about, about defining it. But of course, I will become all philosophical when I get to a point about, about trying, if, if I'm really cornered about defining Asia, I will be, you know, really sort of like uh, <laughs> philosophical and ideological. And so it's not Asia now, it's not a regional concept, obviously. You know, the thing doesn't have to be in Asia or, or, or made by an Asian person or, or, or of course, whether Australia is Asian or not is, is a, I think, a different kind of, of idea. O according to our contemporary thing, you know, it's not regional, and so Australia can, of course, be Asian. You know, uh, Let's be clear, we just want a piece of the music. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of space, and so, you know, <laughs> it, it, event, we call it the black hole because it, you're sort of like, you know, dragged into it, and then once you're in it, there's no way out, and this is it's all sorts of. It's a challenging question because I, I think you know Asia. Asia is is something which is being constructed from the outside now, as much as it's being constructed from its own internal logic, and it's something which we in Australia are very, we're very used to hearing now that mm -hmm. we are part of Asia. APEC just happened in Beijing, you know, yeah, and yeah. Barack Obama is there, and uh -huh. you think, well, what's Barack doing, you know? Yeah, and so so, all of that. so so if it was so this is why. <laughs> This whole thing going on. Okay, right? so We're, you and, help and, me. I, I'm going to tell <laughs> no, my bureaucrat friends. That. No, I, that's why I think your project is actually fascinating because it's actually a, a whole dialogue on where you are you know, navigating this, this moving this moving territory. Yes, uh, I guess one way is that we are we are constructing. One way of answering that would be that we are in the process of of creating what Asia is. That we are in the process, and it's a it's a changing concept maybe it was very limited and regional, and that was why Asia was in all sorts of trouble like 200, you know, 150 years ago, and why now it's such a dynamic uh, concept and that this institution is in the process of, of, uh, of defining it as we move along. And so thank you for... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, given the qualifications that you've explained about the exhibition in Venice, mm -hmm. uh, what I'm curious about is what the jury felt about the exhibition mm -hmm. and what their uh, opinion was and uh, what value they saw in it. I mean, the, the, uh, the judge's brief was, was very brief. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I wasn't really able to talk with... Um, with all of them, but I think uh, they thought that we uh, ventured into a very um, significant topic, that it was, it was a relevant topic. And I think we were in a distinctively, we had a distinct advantage over other uh, national pavilions in that uh, when you sort of look back, and that's a very strange thing for a Biennale to do. You know, Biennales always sort of present themselves at the cutting edge. They are looking at the future. But Rem did a very sort of unusual thing uh, by asking the Biennale to look back. Uh, and so what can happen and often did happen in Venice this year is that it became very nostalgic. So that a lot of the exhibitions looked like they were not relevant at this moment. Uh, because it was very difficult to sort of uh, show something in the past that seemed still relevant and important at this moment. And so the North Korea, South Korea issue was totally that. It, it was, of course, we were looking back, but it's, a, it's one of the most important geopolitical issues, and, and it, depending on how this thing t 
turns out, the whole sort of like world politics can change. And so the show had that kind of edge where uh, we were looking back, of course, but uh, that it had a kind of a contemporary relevance because this was an issue that was ongoing, uh, one of the most important. And that's what I think sort of uh, uh, helped us and you know, the, the, I think the judges thought it was an exciting project because of that fact. Um, and that, is, that gave us an immense exhibition in sort of like trying to sort of like say who, who did a better job. I think everything, was, all the projects that were, you know, uh, uh, had some acclaim were very good. Um, but I think there was also a very deliberate sort of uh, sort of agenda by REM sort of like uh, group uh, to bring in sort of non-mainstream countries into the fold. Uh, two years ago, uh, David was, Chipperfield was, was criticized for being too Eurocentric. So that the only, for the main exhibition, the only non-Western uh, participants was Sejima and one Korean architect and maybe one from India or something like that. And so, so it was sort of, and, and I think Rem was really intent. The, the elements thing I think was also intentional that he was sort of like deliberately, uh, you know, creating a ground zero for the way these elements were being organized. And so it was much more controversial that, that, than I had ever thought. And so I think there was uh, on Rem's part, a deliberate kind of strategy. He brought in certain kinds of judges. That was also a very critical sort of, a lot of people criticized the, 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 all the judges because there was only one architect uh, in the group. Um, I forget his name. Um, he was, he's also OMA, a good friend of ours. <laughs> <laughs> he, he worked on a Korean project and so he knows a, a, a lot about about Korea. Okay. Um, can I? Oh, hang on. There's a question. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. That was a really interesting lecture. I just have a question um, about um, the archive because at a certain point you were comparing your pavilion with the Japanese pavilion and you mentioned that the archival material was presented in a way that was didactic. And in a sense, I'm curious to know yourself as a historian and someone who sort of, you know, yeah, yeah, knows yeah, the archive yeah. well. Uh -huh. um, and then your um, pavilion in Venice and this idea that, well, I'm curious actually, because I'm wondering, would you say that what you were producing in the p uh, pavilion in Venice was documentation or how do you kind of reconcile those two? Maybe I'm sort of, maybe I'm... I don't think you, I don't think you can really reconcile it. I mean, for me, it's not that, that I don't want an archive. I'm, I'm, Half of my time these days exactly, is, is building I mean. up archives, yeah. and so, so, uh, so I do want archives. I, I am for archives. I would rather want it than not have anything. But not having it is is the cold hard reality of of Korea. They they just recently uh, Korea has been starting to build up architectural archives. So there's literally no architectural museum, no architectural collection, and so. You know, as a historian, you 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 can't do work. You know, there's literally no history because there's no archive. Right. And so somebody who writes sort of like goes around interviewing people, sort of like steals material and then sort of does thing. And and that's the way that historical discourse has been produced. And so so we are in the midst of creating an archive. So our position in the Venice Biennale is not that we don't want archives or or we are against them like some Derrida. Deridian sort of, of, of uh, uh, deconstruction. It's, it's just that the reality of it is that way. And so you have to work through it and sort of trying to create some kind of sense out of all of this thing. And so, so we, we create archives, obviously, and what I'm doing in the Asian uh, you know, culture complex. But that, again, again, has all of its problems because you know, when you create an archive in the traditional sense, you know already that this has meaning, that you, you bring this in because you know that this has historical, you know, and that's why it becomes part of the archive and the collection. 
But when you don't have those kind of existing structures, you sort of like, yeah. yeah I think yeah. I'm, I'm, I guess maybe I'm thinking about the more recent role of the curator as the commissioner of new work. And I'm just yeah, wondering yeah, about yeah, the yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. This, this sort uh -huh, of distinction, uh -huh. you as a historian uh -huh, versus, uh -huh. and your reluctance to call yourself a curator, which I understand, but uh -huh. I'm, I'm wondering if there's a tension there for that, you I, I think that's more of an art world phenomenon. Is, is it not? I, I, I haven't really thought about it. In, in the art world, we'll I think the curator or, has yeah. become the new artist, where, where, where now that, that the artwork itself has lost its sort of like object quality and that you're not sort of like looking at it and, and having a transcendent experience, then what's the whole point of, of, of having an exhibition? And I think the role of the curator has become this creative meaning, particularly in the art world. But I'm not sure, I haven't really thought about, it's a great question actually, but I haven't thought about that in terms of, of the architectural world because the architectural object never really had that kind of you know, art object status. And so uh, I'm not, I don't know exactly how to answer that. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting because what, what I was thinking the whole time was of the um, resurgence in the art world in the last decade in particular of interest in the Cabinet de Curiosité or yeah, the yeah. Wunderkammer. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that, that, that the strategy, I wouldn't have said Peter Greenaway so much as a Wunderkammer, mm -hmm. that you, um, you assemble objects and you let people read the meaning into them. So it doesn't mean that there's no intention behind the, assemb the assembly or mm -hmm. the assemblage, mm -hmm. um, but that it's an open-ended thing, which, mm -hmm. is, which is, is very interesting, in fact. Yeah, I, I, I guess th I probably think that there's been a lot of you know, existing literature by now about that phenomena, about, about you know, now there's no star critic, but star curators who, who create a certain kind of discourse nowadays. And so, um, yeah, we could get into that. Uh, let's do it over dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Can I thank all of you that joined us for the EMARC um, reviews today? It's been a fantastic day, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Professor you.